welcome everyone and welcome to uh, Mega Life 21 Live. I'm your host James P. Madonna and I am here with a gentleman, a longtime friend. It's been a very long time since this man has been on a show with me. I'm here with the one and only the evangelist Ken Create. Ken, nice to see you, James. Same here. It's great to have you back. It's been a, it's been a very long time uh, since you've been on my show, and uh, a lot's been happening with uh, the evangelist Ken Create. Um, yeah, Ken Create is on the internet. He can be seen on the web, but most people are familiar with Ken Create uh, with his uh, physical talents in terms of uh, creative dance, mime. Or should I say creative mind um, and um, storytelling, of course, and uh, things of that nature. But they're not familiar with the other part of Can Create, which uh, is all the many years of Bible study right. that you've done, right. that you have under your belt, that evangelists can create. How, how many years have you done Bible study? Well, I accepted Christ in 1982, so that would be 32 years. 32 years. 32 years of formal Bible study. Well, it's a whole process of growing. Yeah. Well, that's a long time. And uh, now uh, you are uh, teaching. Yes. You you like to use the word teacher, not, not minister or a pastor or a deacon or um, or ministry it, it, it is you like to use the word teacher well because even when it comes to teacher see there's different terms in the bible it says uh, a pastor has a flock and the people were underneath the pastor so he takes care of the flock the people in the body of christ right that's his job his job is to teach them the Word of God. Mm -hmm. A preacher, to me, should be more in the terms of your teaching. So it's like if you go to church and you're having fellowship with believers, that pastor is supposed to teach you the Word of God. So it's almost like you're going to school and he's your teacher. Yes. So when you go to church, like you're going to school... You should have your Bible with you. You should have a pen with you. You should have a notebook with you. So whatever he's feeding, yeah. you, you should put that down or circle little or, keywords. Or, or a small tape recorder of some kind. You know, you, well, you, yeah, you could do that. But but it's better to have, like like I said, a notebook, a pen, the word, circle, little jot, little things, okay? Because my pastor taught me. See, he taught. He taught, meaning mm -hmm. he, he was teaching me. Yeah. Okay, the word of God, because we're under grace. We're not under law. Yeah. See, that's a, that, that's a difference there. Now, a lot of people are unfamiliar with exactly what that means. I, I know, for I from what I was told, in the Old Testament, the law was, at that time, was meant for the ancient Israelites. Right, but it was also at that time when the Ten Commandments was given to Moses. It was showing yeah. people that they were a sinner. This is what the right. Ten Commandments represented. Okay. But when Jesus came and walked on this earth, all right, and he died on the cross for your sins and my sins, okay, he said he came to fulfill the law. So anybody who accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, yeah, and they're covered by the blood of Christ. And God forgives all their sins, past, present, future. That's a lot of confusion in there, too. There's a lot of mass confusion. Okay? In, in so it. now he fulfilled the law. All right? So now if Christ becomes your Savior, you're not under the law no more. You're under God's yeah. grace. Well, it's a gift from God. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of these preachers and pastors are doing, they're trying to mix the law with grace. And they're confusing people, okay? So what people really got to understand is you're under grace. It's a gift from God, mm -hmm. lest any man should boast, okay? It's not of works. You can't 
try to prove something to God by doing good works, by helping out people, you know, and doing good things. All right. So there's a difference there. But what these preachers do is they try to combine grace and law yeah. together. So you're under grace. Now, here's an example. When I was going to church, mm -hmm. and, you know, you, you would hear, uh, when you confess your sins, Lord, forgive me, I sinned. So when my one friend taught us one time, when I was done, I said to him, I said, Bill, you mean to tell me you don't ask God for forgiveness of your sins? He goes, Ken, you're forgiven, past, present, and future. Why don't you thank him that you are forgiven? So you are using the word forgiven in there, but you are thanking him that you are forgiven. Well, you got to be sincere. You, you can't be cocky and arrogant about it. You know. You well, because it. well, because what it is, if you really don't understand that, and what he taught me, I started to understand my salvation more. Okay, so if I'm still asking God for forgiveness, I'm not understanding who I am in Christ. Okay, what grace is all about? You're not understanding uh, the whole uh, uh, nature on how salvation works by well, asking. That, uh, right, that's where you miss it out on. So if I did you wrong, and I came and asked you for forgiveness, and you said, Ken, you're forgiven. Why am I going to keep coming back to you and asking you? To forgive me yeah. when you already did. Now, if you if I say I forgive you and you come back and screw me over again right. and again and again, right. I'm gonna like, hey, are we gonna be doing this dance like forever? Well, see what we <laughs> see with humans, it's different. Okay. But with the Lord, it's like every time you screw up, yeah, and and, and you will screw up, like what you just said. Yeah. You're forgiven. Thank him. You are forgiven. Yeah, well, it, it was proven that man was incapable of keeping the law. Even though Absolutely. Even though some people are hung up on it still. Well, that's where the religion comes in. Yeah. A lot yeah. of religious churches are caught up with the law. Yeah, there's a lot of um, um, misinformation. Even like the fire and brimstone preachers. Right. Who are always telling you, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're like, like they were so positive that you were when they don't, they're not God, so they don't really know what's in your heart. Well, like I said, that's where the teachings come in. Yeah. Now, um, grace versus the law. I hope you people have an understanding on what that means now. Uh, of course, when, um, when the Apostle Paul came into the uh, picture, he, his job was to go to the Gentiles. Right. Jesus' job was to go, uh, present the word to the Jews. No, not Jesus. The 12 apostles. The 12 apostles. See, he, he was separated. You see, before Paul became Paul, he was Saul. Yeah. Okay. He was Pharisees. But there was a point in time that it could have been when Stephen was stoned. Yeah. He could have been there. A lot of preachers, teachers said he was there. Okay. But... After then he would follow the apostles around. So now after they were done preaching, he would say with his teachings, the religious teachings, don't listen to these guys. Mm -hmm. These guys don't know what they're talking about. Okay. So now they were on the road to Damascus and he was following them. And you gotta remember, he persecuted a lot of Christians. A mm -hmm. lot. Okay. Now, on the road there, Christ appeared. And blinded him. And he knew it was the Lord because the light was so bright. Okay? He was blinded. So he said, Jesus said to him, So, so, why do you persecute me? And he knew it was the Lord. All right. So he says, I'm going to give you a message. And I'm going to change your name to Paul. And you're going to go to the Gentiles. But first, you're going to meet Dr. Luke. And you're going to get your eyesight back. So he went to Dr. Luke and he got his eyesight back. All right. Now, he told him to go to the Gentiles and present the message grace. Mm -hmm. So in the Bible, Paul says, I was not sent by men, 
This message directly came from Jesus Christ. And the message you're saved under grace. Mm -hmm. So Paul went to all the Gentiles. And the apostles went to all the Jews. Now, when Paul was preaching at the churches, he was saying to them, why are you putting yourself back under the law when you're saved by grace? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in the Bible, when you really start to understand this, okay, this becomes rightly dividing the word of truth, and we're under the dispensation of grace. Mm -hmm. So there was all different dispensations since the beginning. Yeah. And now since we're at the end, we're under the dispensation of grace. But it also says in the Bible, don't water down the message, the doctrine. Oh, yeah. The end of Revelation. Uh, he who tampers with the, uh, any, any, whoever takes away from the book or adds to the book will piss God off quite a bit. Well, yeah, but see, the even, plays, right, have, yeah. but see, even with that, they're adding. Yeah. They're adding. They're saying this is for today, but you're under grace today. Okay. And also, the Holy Spirit works inside you, right? Yeah. But you have a free will to choose. Oh yeah, you you come to crossroads. You have you have different roads to take. It's a, but what your choice, you have the freedom to choose, but you don't have the freedom uh, uh, about you know concerning the consequences of what road you pick. Right now, I was listening to a pastor last night on the radio. All right, and he said it was about forgiving others. Okay. So he says, if you're holding a bitterness against somebody and you can't forgive that person, he says, what you are doing is you're grieving the Holy Spirit. So inside you is the Holy Spirit, right? So you're making the Holy Spirit sad. But now when you go and forgive that person, that burden's lifted from you. Now you're making the Holy Spirit happy. Yeah. Now the Holy Spirit can work inside you. You see what I'm trying to say? And he can clear your mind because the Bible says, renew your mind in Christ. Think on these things, which are heavenly things and not earthly things. Yeah. But if you're holding that bitterness and you can't forgive that person, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit and anything you're doing. All right. For example, I'll give you one example. Sure. If you're watching TV and you're flipping your channels, and there's a show that comes on, and it's a raunchy show, and you're a believer, change the station. But by you watching that, that material is feeding into your mind. And your mind, okay, is like a recorder. Sorry. So the devil is around you, and he's putting in your mind at the same time, hey, isn't the show interesting? Don't you like this? Can't you wait for the next episode to come out? Yeah. So when you feed into that garbage that's on TV, it feeds into your brain, and this is how you think. Brainwashing. Well, yeah, and this is how the devil operates. So that's why it says in the Bible, think on these things. Yeah. Renew your mind in Christ. Renew your mind in Christ is thinking on heavenly things. Yeah. Not worldly things, not lustful things. So you as a believer, if you're feeding into the world and into your flesh, you're not going to grow. Yeah. So when you come in contact with people that don't know Christ, they're not going to see a change about you. You see, they're, they're, they're in darkness. They're lost. You're saved. You're supposed to be your light. That's why the Bible says, let your light shine amongst all people. So your light is supposed to shine right. on people. So if I come in contact with you, all right, and say you use slang words, do I do this? Am I using the same language as you? Like if you say to me, hey, what's up, bro? Do I come back with that same slang? Okay. Or do I come back like to say, pretty good, James? You see what I mean? So now you're seeing a difference in my language. You're seeing a change in my language. That's the light being shined yeah. on you. Well, I, I assume that the uh, temptation uh, is a gradual 
brainwashing process where you they, yes. he's throwing or Satan is throwing little by little at you to get you addicted to something that takes you away from the focus on God. Right. Now what he also does is in the Bible says you're a new creation in Christ. Now what that means is and this is what the amazing thing about God. Okay. When somebody comes and accepts Christ and is covered by the blood and all the sins have been paid for. Okay. The angels marvel at this. Yeah. But they're looking at you like to say, no way, that person's becoming a believer. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, God saves you. It doesn't end there. He's going to work on you. The Bible says he's going to mold and shape you into the image of Christ. Now, in God's laboratory, he loves recreating you to change into Christ. Now, the more he's molding and shaping you into Christ, the angels marvel at this. And they're seeing changes in your life. So they're seeing where you're at. Now, right. if you're running the race, mm -hmm. right, you're here. They can't believe how far you came in Christ. They can't believe what God is doing in your life. They can't believe where he's leading you and where he's bringing you. And yeah. they marvel at this because they can't understand this. Could be how God is reproducing himself. By, uh, well, what he, what he does is see in the Bible it says we are born a corruptible seed. Okay? Right. So when somebody accepts Christ, all right, you're incorruptible seed now. Meaning, when you're born, you're born in the flesh. So, you get, so the sin of Adam and Eve, after the um, um, uh, the repentance and the salvation, the sin of Adam and Eve is washed away. Right. When you accept Christ, that's, that's yes. the first thing that takes place. Right. Because now you, we're born. And this is another thing. People don't understand what born again means. You're not physically born. No, again. you're born in the spirit. Yeah, they keep on. You're only born once. Yeah. Okay. So let's get that straight. Well, they may a lot of people mock the words born again. They make fun of it. Because Honestly, they don't on they because they don't understand. They don't understand. And the Christians don't know how to approach them. Right. Now what the problem with the Christians is is when they go out to witness to people. All right. A lot of them, I did it. Hey, when you died, how do you know you're going to heaven? Mm -hmm. It's a wrong approach. Mm -hmm. I learned that. Okay, by being in the word. And in Paul's letters, he says, look, when you go out to witness to somebody, first of all, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go to talk to that person, let the Spirit inside you, okay, talk for you. Meaning more word that's fed into you, the word of right. God, the more information is going to come out of you. All right. And he also says, now, when you're witnessing to somebody, all right, don't bring your approach. Hear them out. Find out what they're all about. And then you can get in a conversation. Right. And slowly you can lead that into Christ. So if somebody I met was talking about, oh, I can't believe what's going on in this world. And they're talking. Now I can have a conversation with them. Because you also got to understand, it's great that you know the word of God. That's fantastic. But it's great also to know, the world's knowledge. So now you got both knowledges. So now when I'm talking to this individual and he's talking about a certain situation going on in the world, I can relate to him. All right. But through that, I can say to him, yes, you're right, but there's a way to escape and bring the message to him. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going up to that individual and saying, hey, if you die tonight, how do you know you're going to heaven? Don't walk right away from me. Hey, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Don't walk right away from you. Okay? Are you born again? Do you know what it means to be born again? Don't walk right away from you. No. Listen from them. Hear them out. Mm -hmm. And the more knowledge, like I said, if you know about the world, because mm -hmm. you're living here. Yeah. Okay? You can feed that information, what, what you know about in the world, then you can click. Okay? Okay? And then through that, you can bring out salvation to somebody.
So that's my approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, we're obviously living in the end times. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. I mean, with, with the world crisis, the, the extreme negative world crises that are happening all over the world, and with the wars, with corruption and scamming, and uh, dishonest people are everywhere, and uh, 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 greed is definitely everywhere. You know, it's like profit before people and the planet. Uh, our corporations taken over. Uh, politicians are paid off. Corruption, you know, and and they don't care what happens to the environment. They don't care what happens to to the, the survival of, of of the life on Earth. It, it's 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 an obsession with money that never ends. Well, even like what you're talking about right yeah. there. That's another thing that Christians don't understand. Because I'm in fellowship with different Christians. Yeah. I do different shows in the body of Christ. So God makes me watch. God makes me see. I hear people's conversations. Now, what you said was we're living in the last days. Christians don't understand. The last days began when the message of grace was given to Paul. Over 2,000 years ago. The last days began yeah. uh, because mean, the, when the people talked to Paul and Paul explained to them, they thought Christ was ready to appear. So what he was really saying to him, not in your time. All right. So what that basically means, last days is when the grace message began. Right. You're under the dispensation of grace, which has been going on now for 2000 years yeah. where we are right now. Okay, mm -hmm. is we're a second away before midnight. Christ is ready to yeah. return at any minute. We are past the last days. We're there yeah. where the cuckoo clock is ready to strike. Yeah. So we got to get that straight to people. Yeah, well, because well, a day and a year to God is like nothing. It's like a nanosecond. It's nothing, you know. And everything has to happen in in the correct time sequence. You know, um, uh, maybe certain things in history in the Old Testament happened for a, a reason um, because, like in other words, civilization could have advanced way before modern times. I mean, there were there was certain things in history, like the Tower of Babel, and then there was... Uh, the destruction of the the great libraries in Alexandria, right. Egypt, where all the Greek scientists right. had. Uh, uh, the the point is that the world was reaching uh, right. progress and then made big setbacks. Right. Because possibly, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci, the Pope, the Catholic Church kept him down, suppressed right. him. Uh, same thing with uh, Galileo, Copernicus. There, every time there was an advancement in science back then, uh, something happened where there was a big setback. So maybe knowledge was not meant to be acquired that soon until now. Because right. it does say in, in the end times that knowledge will be advancing tremendously. Well, see, that's another thing, too, because you can go back into the Old Testament where it says knowledge will increase. People will go to and fro. To and fro means you know, helicopters, 747s, trains. Transportation, fast. Fast, okay. Yeah. Now, it says also that knowledge shall increase. So let, let, let's give a little example here, okay. Uh, you had the man who discovered the telephone bell, right? Alexander Graham Bell. Okay. So he started out with a communication of maybe two... Things I could hear you, I can't hear you. Okay, so through that, well, he discovered, you know, that you can communicate with somebody else. And then it went to another line, and then it went to a telephone. Right. All right, and then they advanced it to push, to push things, tones. Push tone, yeah. Okay, now they advanced it to cell phones. Now they're combining the computer or the laptop right. with a phone, a tablet, and blah, blah, right. blah. Right, yeah, okay. okay, so now just using that as an example. Now use the example with the phonograph, how that started. Okay. All right, and then it went to 33s and uh, 45s. 
And then from there, it advanced to A tracks. Then from there, it advanced to CDs. No, cassettes. Cassettes. And then CDs. Then CDs. And now they're in the process of making it almost like a chip. And you can store everything on that. I, I or it's going to take over the CD. I have one in the car. It's a little flash drive. You can, you can fit like a thousand or more songs on there. Right. Okay. So yeah. now with that. All right, it says knowledge shall increase. That's it's a, here. It's here. It's here. So like I said, getting back to the last days. They're growing organs in a laboratory. Organs. Exactly. With the uh, stem cell, you know, a DNA. Exactly. It, you know, I mean, it's here. All right, right. So but getting back to the last days, we're right before it's going to strike 12. Yeah. And the problem with the believers is, and even people I know who are believers. Yeah. Ah, Christ ain't going to come for 50 years. Ah, he's not going to come in our lifetime. So an individual that thinks like that, to me, is showing they're sleeping. They're, they're not ready. They're avoiding. Something. They're not alert. Well, to me, it's Fear. like you're living. Well, to me, it's like you're living in the flesh. Well, well how do they know? Do they have a bat phone to God? How do they know? When, when the end is well, coming. because what it is, they can't face the facts. You got to get your acting. Nobody out. knows. Not even the angels know the exact time. No, that's true. But also, you got to look into something in the Bible. Yeah. All right. Where the apostles said that Jesus will tell us the time and the hour. And he says, well, not even the Son of Man knows. All right. So now you got to also look at when Jesus walked this earth, right? And he was God, he walked as man. All right now, this is a mystery to us. So maybe when he said that, he was walking as man, and that was taken away from him. See what I'm trying to say? Because you got to remember, he's God. Mm -hmm. So now, when he went to heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, maybe he does know because he's God. I have no idea. Okay, but that's just uh, a question out there. All right. Yeah. Now another thing, when it comes to free will. And God gives you a choice. Right. All right. We got to look at it this way. When God created everything and he created the angels and he created one of the top angels, Archangel, and his name was Lucifer. Now look in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament describes how God created this angel. It was it was a perfect uh, angel. It a, well, it was not only a perfect had, angel. Had a lot of talent, too. Well, yes, but it was not only a perfect angel that can go to and fro, but the way he was created and what was clothed on him with rubies and diamonds. So when he flew around, you see all these brilliant lights coming off of him. He was the morning star. He was br bright. He was yeah. brilliant. Okay. But now, God gives you a choice. Mm -hmm. See, God did not create the angels. God did not create us as robots. They have free will. They have you free have will. a free will. Because if God created you as a robot and created the angels as a robot, where's that free will to worship him? There is no free will. Yeah, what's, will. what's the point of everybody's right. a robot? Everybody's programmed. Right. You know? Programmed, all right? So now, he gave him all this power. Right. And he gave him dominion to rule. Yeah. Right, because you got to remember, God is the beginning, God's the end. Okay, He knew what He was going to do. All right, but I can't question God because He's the Creator. Yeah, but, I mean, but, he, he let it happen. He lets things happen. Uh, you know, for certain reasons. Well, there's, uh, there, there's reasons. But right? He know, but He knows, He knows what's going to happen. But He lets them happen anyway. Uh, either it's a test or a blessing. I don't know, but. It's it, it is a lot of mysterious things. Absolutely. Like, like before the spirit that became Jesus. Right. When he created the uh, heavens and, and the earth, the right. universe. What on earth did God and the word do before that when there was nothing? They just sat in complete darkness with no no stars, no planets, no suns. No, no, Earth, no. I mean, what did they do? What, did they get bored? Well, that that's, that's a deep question. Well, it's a deep question, but that's what's blind from our mind because of sin. Yeah. All right? Because when Christ comes back and people are at the judgment seat of Christ and you get your rewards, all right, that's another thing. Um, heavenly places. Unless heaven is like another uh, dimension, like a parallel universe, and the heaven and the, the universe is part of the material world, and 
That no, I, I don't I, I don't know, okay, because there's three heavens. Yeah. But anyway, okay, when it comes to what you're talking about, that's blank out of our mind. But one day when everything is revealed in you by Christ and you're like Christ, yeah. you're gonna know <laughs> what God was doing, all right, when there was nothing. We don't know that right now because of sin. We don't know why. Lucifer fell and became Satan. We don't know that. So there's things that we don't know that are blank from us because of sin. Now, anyway, getting back to Lucifer. Now, he's doing all this brilliant stuff, and a third of the angels were watching him. And he had like a third of his angels, and they were under his like command. Okay. He got so big for his britches, and envy and pride set in him was like, wow, might have been getting applause from the, the, the angels. And he might have been like, well, wait a minute. I could do this. I could do that. I could do this. I'm brilliant. Look at me. I'm, I'm flying all around. I lit up the sky. Hey, I could be like God. In fact, I'm going to go to his throne and overthrow him. So now he goes and, and there was a war in heaven. Okay, and it's almost like God looking at him and like, are you kidding me? Get out of here. Okay, so he cast him down. Okay, now let's look at him, Lucifer, free will, free choice. Now, free will, free choice means, look, you worship God out of love. That's your free will. Yeah. That's your free choice. Now, what's on the other side of free will? That could be sin. So free will is worshiping God, okay? What's the other free will? Going against God. That could be sin. So you got, boom, do you worship God yeah. out of love? One. Or number two, I'm going to be like God. Don't tell me what to do, God. Yeah. Sin, envy, pride. That's your choice. Yeah, pride. The first sin was, of course, vanity, you know, when... Uh First sin, yeah, but then of course Adam and Eve uh, ruined it for everybody. By uh, no, no, well, see, that's where people get the wrong interpretation too. You got to understand. First, God created Adam, and then when he was sleeping, he took his rib and created Eve. Yeah, all right, and they cling together as a couple, which would go into marriage. Well, the the, the marriage right? ceremony came right but thousands of years after, you know. Well, no, no, no. Because they had offspring, they had kids. Okay, so they cling to one another. They they joined. I meant together. the ceremony. Right. It's All not, right. Yeah. But but what I'm saying is, getting back to them. Okay. Adam and Eve was the first two individuals, human beings that God created. Right. Let us create them in our image. But they were in paradise. Okay. Right. All right. Now. That stems from the human beings, Adam and Eve, that that's our mother and that's our father yeah. when they were created. Humans, okay? Now, God could have created you, James, and he could have created Sally, all right? And put you in the garden. You would have took of it too. You mean took of the forbidden fruit? Absolutely. Okay, so not let's not blame... See, we're putting the blame on them. Yeah, but God, God told them not to eat from that tree. I understand that. But, and they did it. Right. So let's replace them with James and Sally. So free, You would have done it too. So free will for the angels caused a big problem. Right. Free will for, for humans, for man and woman caused right. a big problem. Right. Uh, anytime free will is involved, there's a, a, a crisis or sin arises. Exactly. And, uh, you know, if they, um, of course, it was meant to be that they ate from the tree. Now, right. if they didn't eat from the tree, then all of us would have been born in paradise. Right. Okay. No, nobody would get sick. Nobody would feel cold. Right. Nobody would feel too hot. Right. Nobody would have to go to work right. and deal with some asshole employer. Right. Right. And so on and so forth. But, but see, like I said, in creation, there had to be a problem there. Mm -hmm. And that has to deal with free will. Right. Okay. So why did they fall? Why were they disobedient? You see what I'm trying to say? Why? 
Why? Temptation. It has it has the games. It has to deal something with free will. Okay, because I heard the one preacher say, like, why does God let this all go on when he can wipe us out in a half a second and recreate everything? And, and recreate new human beings. I, okay? I tell you what, you ever notice with, with most human beings, with most people, if you tell them something brand new that they never heard before, they instead of having an open mind and really listening to you, they right away they deny it. They they put it down. They go. They they ignore you. They change the subject. It's like they automatically have this uh, reaction to something that they must something that they could be learning that's different. They automatically push it away. So that could, they, they that's are, a negative part of free will. Yes. Okay. But they, and also they don't understand. All right. Because, like I said, with that free will, you, you have a choice. Yeah. Okay? And in that choice, that's up to you. All right? And what the problem is in the body of Christ today mm -hmm. is, like, the one preacher said, all right, we're spoiled brats. God's children are spoiled brats. Mm -hmm. So you think that, okay, I got married, and I've been married eight years, and I'm a believer, and I have two kids. All right. But my wife's nagging about this and that instead of, you know, being in the word mm -hmm. and praying together and growing our kids up. OK. In the fear and the nurture of the Lord, we're we're slowly drifting apart. Mm -hmm. We're all of a sudden the man is separated from the wife. And the wife was like, I want to get a divorce. So now they get a divorce. Now they look at that as believers and say, OK. Well, I'm forgiven. All right. So now since I'm forgiven, I'm going to, I don't want to be lonely. So now I'm looking for another mate. All right. So now they go and take advantage of that, meet somebody, believer or non-believer or whatever, and they remarry. Mm -hmm. But they think in God's eyes, that's okay. All right. But little did they know is when you go into holy matrimony, what does it say? You cling on to one another to best set the apart. Okay. okay. Better. So in God's eyes, it's like, no, you're taking advantage. You're taking advantage. What do you, so you don't get along with that one and you're married two years and you get a divorce and it's like, okay, I'm forgiven. So let me go get another one. It's uh, it's like um, we're spoiled, James. You're giving up. You, they give up right away. Uh, 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 you know, it's like, um, Instead of taking on life's problems as they come, they want to run away. And divorce is a way of running away. You know, if two people wanted to save it, they could save it. They can go to, for, to a psychologist, to a marriage counselor. It could be saved if two people want to save it. They want to compromise. I agree. But, but people are too selfish to compromise. Love that, but that's where the word comes in. You got to be in the word to be self to lose that selfishness. Yes, you have to be in the word. Right. You have to be in prayer. You have to be in fellowship. Individuals are edifying each other, building each other up. All right, but like I said, we become spoiled. Forgiveness, uh, couples forgiving each other and starting fresh, starting new. You know? Hey, we are spoiled brats. Okay, so what it is is before Christ returns. All right. You'll see a falling away in the body of Christ. All right. Oh, yeah. Now. They're saved. But they're getting out of fellowship with Christ. Yeah. All right. And or they're listening to other things that is like, let's put it this way. Paul says spiritual gifts. One's given this gift. The other's given this gift. The other's given that gift. Yeah. All right. So he says, I rather you. Walk in love, then have a gift, because that gift you have, once you get puffed up with that, you're taking your eyes off of Christ. And now you're focusing on the gift more than yeah. Christ. It's like material possessions, uh, obsession with money, like with the rich, uh, sports cars, whatever suits your fancy, you know, Ferrari, Lamborghini, right. BMW, mansions. Money becomes idolatry. Right. It becomes their God. Right. And and no matter how much money they, they receive, it's never enough. Right. So that takes them away from God, takes the focus away. But in the end times, 
Well, you that's can, where that's where you got to get off that yeah. word in the end times. You got to get in on the word. Christ is ready to return. But Christ, because we're like you said, we're a minute before midnight. I think we're I think we're yeah. later than that. Well, it, it, look up to Timothy, people. Uh, it describes how people, how the human race will become. Their hearts will get harder and harder and colder. Right. Uh, uh, just, I, I was telling Ken create uh, before we went on the air. That uh, perfect example is the story of uh, a homeless man uh, lying on a sidewalk like he was sleeping, and people just stepped over him like he was like roadkill, like he was uh, invisible because the man was broke and homeless. You you immediately lose your humanly value when you become broke in America, you know, and homeless. But it turned out the man was dead. Uh, he was mugged or uh, whatever he was beat up and he he was killed and it's bad enough he was homeless right and nobody called 911 nobody called the police nobody cared nobody cared there was no empathy there was no compassion right you know and that's a perfect example on people becoming cold right and with no compassion or empathy so, uh, uh, very selfish uh, uh, and then there's greed. I mean, it sounds a lot like the, the right-wing conservatives, <laughs> Republicans rather. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's here. You can see it all around you. Right. Now, also, to continue what you're saying, because yeah. it's a similar thing, but different. It deals with the homeless. I was listening to a pastor on the radio, and uh, he's in Jersey. He says... Him and his son he brings to the hockey games. Yeah. So they go see the New Jersey Devils. He says, when I would come out, he says, well, we walk to our car. He says, there's little homeless people everywhere. Okay. So he said, we just go about our business and hop in our car and drive back to our house. Nice house, comfy. Got this, got that, got this. Got supplying our needs. Great, he says. All right. And he says, and I'm taking care of the flock, and I see the church growing and stuff like that. He says, but God was showing me something. That's good what you're doing in the body of Christ, and you're growing, and the church is growing. What are you doing outside the body of Christ? All right? So he says, a couple weeks passed, went back to the devil game, right? Yeah. Same situation. He got home, he said, the Lord started talking to me. The Holy Spirit started talking to me. And he said, the Holy Spirit told me, when you walk by them homeless people, you're not paying attention to them. All right? He says, what you're going to do for one day, one night, you're going to be homeless. And you're going to go there. And you're going to be one of them. All right, and you're gonna see everything that they do. All right, and not only that, when the people come out of the arena from the hockey game, you're gonna see what they do, and I'm gonna show you that's what you do when you come out of the game. You know, there was a movie like that one time. I think Mel Brooks. I, I could be wrong. Mel Brooks played the homeless person, and, and he was rich and right. stingy and selfish and greedy, and the judge. There was some situation where the judge demanded that he live in the street like the people he, right. he treated like like crap. You know, right. and, uh, uh, yeah, it's just sad that in, well, it is, the material world is the devil's world, but it, it's sad that once you become broke and, and penniless, that your human value is, is gone and people ignore you. You become invisible, you know. Right. And, now, but what he should have done was, if he really wanted to grow as a Christian, he should have. Well, that's where I want to continue. Right, go, ahead, go, go ahead. Okay. Now, he says he put the homeless clothes on, raggedy pants, dirty hair, dirt, just like yeah. that. Uh, sneakers dirty. And he says, I went there, parked my car somewhere. God told me he parked it. And I just went into the crowd. Mm -hmm. And I, I started asking questions. He says, with the homeless people, socks are very big. Because of the winter. Right? I, I would think coats and everything. Well, yeah, he said, but the socks, because that's the first thing that gets cold, is your feet. Your feet. And your hands and your ears. So protection of feet, hands, and ears. Very big with homeless people. Okay. So he says, now, I'm playing that role. 
All right, I'm like one of them, and we're eating out of garbage cans. People coming by, you know, hey, could you help us out? Get out of here, you bum, the whole nine yards. He says, now, he says, we're drawing from the cops, all right, almost to the arena. And now all the people start coming out of the arena. And they're looking at us like, couldn't, like you yeah. don't exist, like you're yeah. invisible. Like it's not their problem. Right, and they walk right by him. All right. So we said, God, show me. This is what you do when you walk out of this place. So he says now. So what I'm doing, he says, since I seen all that, he says, and I walked in their shoes. He says, what I am doing now is I am building a ministry there with tents. And we're going to feed the homeless. We're going to give them clothes, socks, whatever they need. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get the word of God to these people. So he says, when I came out of the arena and I seen this, he says, this is what I should have been doing. But he says, I didn't care. Right. God had to show me something, okay, so I can do something for the homeless. So he said, if I came out of that place yeah. and seen what was going on and tried to help them out, he says, it might have clicked that, wow, I'm going to build tents, give them food, give them clothes, all right, and minister to them. But he said, it took me to be in people's position. To understand. To yeah. understand what these people are going so through. And then all of a sudden he had the compassion and the empathy. Uh, uh, when people are down and out. Well, because he was there. He you know, lived there when, pe that. when people are down and out, even when, when the rich lose everything, uh, you know, and everything's taken away from them, then all of a sudden they change and they become humble. They, they become humble when they're, when they're down and out, but when they're not, it's like when somebody, you know, grew up in a, in a poor, rough neighborhood, right. let's say, or even in the suburbs, and they grew up and they had friends that they, they knew since right. childhood. And then all of a sudden they become rich and famous right. and they forget everybody. Right. They forget their family and their friends. You know what I mean? And uh, hey, they might lose everything and they might have to go back to their neighborhood and to their family and friends. But the point is they uh, it's 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 just peculiar how people's personalities change when they need something desperately. They become nice and humble all of a sudden. And then well, yeah, I agree with you. When they're independent and rich, they're arrogant. I agree with and you. They don't care. You know, it's like, oh, everything's not their problem. Right. But getting back to that story. Yes. It took the Lord to show him something to do something for these homeless people. Yeah. And he said, I was wrong. He said, I automatically should have jumped on that. And I didn't. And he says, I was wrong. So he said, God does show us things. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when we see things, we should take advantage of them. So I looked at that situation and, sh and should have said, I'm going to do something for these people. No. It took the Lord to say to me, you're going to walk in their shoes. <laughs> well, and see what's going on. Divine messages today come in this form, maybe in the Old Testament, you would hear a voice from the sky or an angel would appear in front of you. But now the messages are subtle that, you know, they're, they're, they're through. They could be through anything, the radio, well, the TV, the pe people. Well, that's why it says in the know. Bible, you walk by faith, not sight. Right. It's by faith because uh, faith is hope. That's something in this case. Well, is true. faith, faith is you're believing what Christ did for yeah, you. You're I, believing he walked this earth. You're I mean, believing he well, died on the cross. You can't, for your you can't prove it in a material world because material worlds are based on uh, the material world is based on science, and you have to have proof. So you you only have faith. No, well, faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. Yeah. So your faith is based on that book, that Bible. That's where your faith is based yeah. on. But before you come and go into that book and somebody talks to you, do you accept what Christ did for you? Now, if you did, and that is found in the Word of God, but you didn't pick up the book yet, all right, and you're trusting on that, 
then you're believing that he did walk this earth. Yeah. That he did die on a cross for your sins and my sins. That's faith. Now, when you trust in the finished work of Christ and he becomes your savior, all right, now you start getting in the word and the word starts opening you up. And once that book starts opening you up and you're walking around and you're seeing stuff in this world totally different than that book, you're like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's putting you down, or somebody's harping on you, all right, it's like, why? But when you go to the Word, you see why. So if I go out to witness to somebody and somebody puts me down, you know, you're a crackpot, what are you doing this for? You're weird, all right? When I go in the Word, the Word says, blessed is the man who's persecuted for my name. So I'm blessed, all right? So if I'm being persecuted because my faith is in Christ, I'm blessed. So if I'm blessed from God, what do I care about man, what they say? Count it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations. So if I'm going through trials and tribulations, what that means is I'm going through a storm. But God is making me stick close to Christ and grow in Christ. Yeah. Now, when I'm persecuted, put down the whole nine yards or something backfires in my life. And I'm sticking close with the Lord. I'm in fellowship with God. All right. I'm in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I'm in fellowship with Christ. I'm turning more into Christ. I'm running my race. I have my eyes on Christ. Mm -hmm. All right. Then that joy of the Holy Spirit inside me is coming alive. And the Holy Spirit is happy inside. So now when people see me, like example, real quick. I'm working with a carnival guy. I pull up this guy's block. Truck conks out. Can't move it. Running late to this guy to get his party going. He's swearing. He's cursing. He's this. He's that. He has a truck. Skeletons. Right? Heavy metal. Right? Okay. Fine. He comes out of his house. He's yelling. He's screaming. Yeah. I'll kill that guy. I'll go up to that carnival guy. I'll blow his brains out. All right? So the guy, the kid that he knew, he walked home. He said, my friend's crazy. And I'm seeing it all, but I'm seeing demons all over this guy, all over this guy. I mean, he like, he snapped, but you can see there's two personalities. All right. So we finally get the truck down the hill and he comes down the hill and he's looking at me and he looks at me and he goes, Hey, you, I said, yeah, he goes, get that smile off your face. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, you got a smile on your face this big. He says, I'll rip that smile right off your face. And I'm just standing there. But what he is seeing is the light. And he thought I was laughing at him. Yeah. What are you laughing at me for? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you're smiling, bro. This ain't funny. So you see, he's seeing light. And I'm just hanging out. Yeah. So what that is, is I was going through a trial right there in that situation because this guy was crazy. All right. I'm minding my own business, hanging out, trying to calm things down. Yeah. All right. The Holy Spirit inside me is glad, is happy. All right. So the Holy Spirit starts shining on my face and I'm smiling and I don't even know it. And he's like, what are you laughing about? Right. But that's making the Holy Spirit happy inside you. OK. So now if I witness to somebody like one lady I witnessed at one time. And she says to me, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but she says, you got a smile on your face this big. And she says, your eyes and, you, and your face is glowing. That's a joy to the Lord. Because what I am talking to her about, Christ, makes me happy. And then the Holy Spirit works inside me and he's glad. Mm -hmm. So now it's all over my face. Okay. Now, people call that, oh, that's the anointing. The anointing just came on you. Oh, I can see it in your eyes. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit lives inside you, James. All right? So do you bottle the Holy Spirit up inside you, or do you release the Holy Spirit? Well, you you, you don't make a, a, a spectacle out of it. You know, you, you, you do it. You do it the way you normally do things, uh, according to your personality. Some people are 
quiet and, and, and soft spoken. Some people are excitable. It depends on your personality. Whatever, whatever, however you can express your joy, you do it. Yeah, but see, you got to realize once you understand what salvation means to you and what Christ did yeah. for you, and you're in the Word and you're in prayer and you're in fellowship, okay, it, it should just hit you. What about my neighbors? What about my family? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or are you going to keep this to yourself and say, well, that's their problem? You know what I mean? When I die, I know I'm going to heaven, but uh, whatever with them. So it's like you're going to a building and the building's on fire. And you see somebody in that building and they're saying, help, help. And you can help that person. Are you going to let that person die in the fire? No. Or are you going to try in a way to get them out of the fire? Well, that's the message you of You have to uh, share and, uh, and help the people who need help. You, know, you get the word out, just like Jesus. You get the word like Jesus out. Jesus visited, uh, had dinner with the, with the prostitute and the uh, and and uh, what, a Roman or something. Yeah. yeah. In other words, he didn't stay in his little cubby hole. You get the word out. He was out. out helping people who needed help. Right. Now, people that are not spiritual that live in the world, you know, material things are their god. You know, they're important to them. You know. To a person who's spiritual, being rich is not a priority to them. Well, yeah, but I'm saying no, but that's where you're wrong. Well, you're supposed to because be content. Because that's what they're told. That's what they're told. You're supposed to be content with contentment. Which right. The Bible says if you have a uh, uh, shelter, your health, right. food on right. the table. Right. You know what I mean? You should be. That's that's uh, wealth right there. If you have your needs right. being met, exactly. But to be rich. Like Joel Osteen talks about, right. and to get even richer, right? That's not. Uh, but it's but see, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like, where are your priorities? What are you doing with your money? Exactly. Now, if it's coming in and you're rich and you're flowing it back out to spread the word of God and help people in need, all right? Uh, Feed the homeless, your brothers, sisters in Christ. Yeah. Okay. Give uh, to certain pastors you might like on um, listener support radio. Yeah, a food pantry. Right. Uh, yeah. You got that green. So go now bless others. You know, Nothing uh, wrong with it. Feeding starving children in Africa. Uh, supplying, Nothing wrong with Supplying it. food pantries for the homeless. You know, to so on and so forth. That there's nothing wrong with it. Well, so because you're doing good with your money, well, helping other people. That's what I mean. Yeah. So like, I'll give you an example. Mariana Rivera. Okay. Oh, He's yeah. a believer. Yes. Right? All the money's coming in. All right. Oh, look what he's doing in Panama. He's building churches. He fixed up the church for his wife. He's building in Rochelle. He's, he's building New Rochelle, New York. Right. His wife has, uh, she outgrew her home. Her right. Bible study got so big right. that she wants to be a pastor. Or maybe she is right. already. And he, he bought a church that needed a lot of work. Right. And he's doing it. Yeah, because he yeah. can do it. Now, another guy that was in uh, the NBA yeah. went for a huge contract. All right, but when I read his biography, all right, that money he took, yeah. he built two churches and he built the school. Right. Now all these kids have the uniforms they wear, they get showers, food, everything. They're taken care of. Yeah. And his contract at the time was a hefty contract. But when I see something like that, it's like, wow, you just got a hundred million. If you're going for two hundred. And you're going to bless others. Go for it. Go for it. Go yeah. for it. And you're not going to change. And it's not going to change you. And you're going to continue. To, that's it. To help to bless others, other people. Bless others. Well, to, to help. To help the that, poor. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you hoard the, the then that's if, a problem. If, if you're a billionaire and you hoard the money and you don't help uh, people in need, then that's greed. Well, well, then that's greed. Well, basically, billionaires. The majority of them, they're lost. They don't know Christ. Yeah. But I'm talking, if you're a millionaire and you're saved and you, you don't bless others, that's yeah. wrong. Because now that yeah. money becomes your God and becomes yeah. your idol. And now you're taking your eyes off of Christ. It could be a, well. it could be a famous basketball player in Absolutely. the NBA that gives back to his the, the, the neighborhood he grew right. up in. Maybe he builds a, a new boys club in his old neighborhood. Well, but he James, that's the, good. He helps the... Uh, that's good. F you know, uh, uh, feed the... Right, but that's good. Yeah. But if he's not a believer, he's trying to do that to prove something to God. And God says, that's good work. So he's trying to work, win... I'm sorry, blah. he's trying to win brownie points with God. 
by doing good deeds, right. but he might not be a believer. Right. So yeah. now he figures when he leaves this world, God will weigh more of the good he did, okay? Like, he did more good and lesser evil. But God says, no, you're born in this world telling lies, okay? You're born in the flesh. You're born into sin, all right? And the only way... You can get right with me and be in fellowship with me. And when you leave this world, you come home to me is you have to be covered by the blood of Christ. Without that, you're lost, bro. You're lost. Okay. Uh, and I'm going by the word. That's it. Yeah, you guys, as long as you go by the word. <laughs> it's the word of God. And, and that's speak, what I speak scripture. That's it. I believe uh, it. You know, there's a lot of people who make up their own rules. And uh, that's why I don't I don't like organized religion. They make up. Man, they have man-made rules. And uh, I'm not interested in organized religion. I'm interested in what's actually in the Bible. Absolutely. And uh, you should try to get the King James Version. The King is James is very strong because now they went to other uh, inspirational okay, writings and stuff. Yeah. Like you have American Version. Yeah. There's all different kind of versions. And you need a concordance. You need a concordance because I have them too. But I basically, okay... My Bible, because I have like six or seven of them, yeah. is I stick to the King James. And I like the eyes and the dies. The dies and dows and uh, yes. you know, old English. I, yeah. I, I like that. That's what I like yeah. studying. All right, cool. I mean, very, very good. Uh, uh, very good. I don't want to say cool, because then that's more. <laughs> yeah, we'll, let's use the King's English here. Right. Uh, but anyway, that you want to wrap it up, take a break? Yeah, we can take a break. All right. Thank you for joining Absolutely. us. Uh, joining me here on Mega Life 21 Live, you have just uh, seen the introduction of the evangelist can create. This is this is our first live show ever on uh, through uh, live stream, and uh, it was very enlightening and very invigorating indeed. That's for sure. And uh, uh, this is St. Patrick's Day weekend, you know. So uh, salute to all the Irish. Americans, uh, Irish people out there, and uh, um, let's see, uh, it's the the, the the 15th, right? Right. 17th would be uh, Monday. Okay. So it is uh, Saturday uh, afternoon, um, uh, March the 15th, uh, 2014, when uh, this show was made. So thank you. And, and well, we're going to be back with actual sermons behind the pulpit by the evangelist can create so don't go away <laughs>